to the final segment of What's Hot in Tucson 2021, the live broadcast day four. Right after um, this segment, we're going to take three days off, and then we're going to come back starting next Thursday, same bat time, uh, 10 a.m. to noon to noon, to noon 30, uh, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So for our final segment of the day, we are headed back to England, where we are going to meet up with Crystal Classics, and apparently we have Arch du Duchess Stefania or something. <laughs> <laughs> not, not sure he had a duchess because he actually stayed unmarried his whole life. Otherwise, I don't think he could have amassed this collection that he did. I'm not sure any woman would have put up with it. <laughs> but um, well, yes, perhaps I'm your Stephanie channeling is, is tendencies. And hello, everyone. Go ahead, Deanna. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So. Can you hear us all right? Yes, we can hear you fine. Whoops, there we go. Good, good. So, to my... It's Arctur Stefan. Hello. To my gift again. Um, we'll give a great introduction to... Fire away. Thank you very much. Well, Archduke Stefan was uh, lived in the time of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and was obviously of aristocracy with that title. And uh, he was born in 1817 uh, in September and uh, lived a relatively short life, uh, dying in 1867. Uh, but in this period, he amassed a collection of minerals numbering about 20,000 in total, which was absolutely remarkable for its day uh, and probably the largest mineral collection in the world at, the, at its time, it, it, even surpassing you know, famous mu museums, particularly in Europe, which were perhaps just starting the collections around that period. Be interested in other sorts of collections, botanical and zoological. And in, in a period of perhaps only about 20 years of his, the latter part of his life, he amassed his B, uh, zoological, but botanical and mineralogical. The minerals were by far the biggest collection. And it later passed to uh, Karl Rumpf, of which we can show you a picture of shortly. So there's, there's Mr. Rumpf. And yeah, 1867. And Rumpf actually did not acquire this collection until 1888. So that collection was laying in the castle unattended to and, and more or less um, neglected. And Rumpf then acquired it and actually could not um, enjoy it much because he died in 1889, so which is quite remarkable. And, and it's actually thought that probably the majority of the collection was still wrapped up when Rumpf died and he didn't actually get to see it, which is a great pity. But there's a consequence, and we're, we're a bit unsure how this came about. We imagine it was after he died, a lot of this, all the specimens were labelled with a C Rumpf label as well to show that it had passed through his hands at some point. Uh, and, and incidentally, Rumpf was a, an industrialist. He was a German industrialist, a chemist, and uh, uh, was in partnership with, I think what still exists now is Bayer Industries. Yeah, he might have uh, married one of the daughters yes. and became one of the CEOs of the Bayer yes. RD or AD. Exactly, AG. and hence had the uh, means to buy the collection. Why don't we really swap into the minerals? Because it is not really about the minerals when you look at them. Um, because amassing such a large collection will um, or resulted in them not always being the most showy specimens. So a lot of them are really just uh, specimens that are uh, representatives of the species, but what is really imp important about the Archduke Stefan collection, and let's go straight into a specimen, why not start with a Hewlandite? And um, what is really um, remarkable about specimens is 
the labels. So it is all about the labels, having the Archduke Stefan labels. They are all numbered. So now this one, for example, is number 239.30. So, and usually the specimens themselves will represent exactly this number. So you have 239.30 on the bottom here. And then here you see also the rump label. So neat handwriting. So they are all handwritten little labels, those rump labels. And that is what it's really about. This snapshot in time, that historic aspect of having uh, these labels and the labels are far out some in some cases they really outweigh the worth of the specimen yes. they are coming with because the specimen normally is not that showy so this is just a nice example where we actually see crystals and not just an ore um, which is normally um, the case Whereas if you stay on the case then we can see um, better and I think we dive into something, why not into something colorful like this cross of color? I think, Peter, you like this specimen. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by cross of color, especially one that's that old and seems to be holding its color very nicely. So that's, uh, that's a good sign. Well, well, I guess most of the period of time and sometimes you will see some and we come across some of the specimens here in the case. So you have this chrysocolla and then you have this wonderful matching label with it. Mm -hmm. But, and there you also, it obviously got misidentified because it is saying malachite. So sometimes you will see species that are incorrect, but the locality and everything else is, is matching because they are later on were then renamed or re-identified. So he did this all himself, Archduke Stefan. Although a keen interest, he probably would have not always. Yes, I think at some point he did employ a mineralogist, which helped. But of course, at that period in the 1800s, a lot of these things were ill-defined. And, uh, you know, we spoke last night catalog and really none of them carried the names we know now they just had to try and best describe them by the chemical composition what they could well that's why there's those uh, publication publications of obsolete mineral names that let you try to link some of the terminology that was yes. used then with what we use today there's an aspect one thing i would like to also show yeah, you go ahead, Lauren. I'm so oh, sorry. Oh, the, these are, you know, not only the labels, but they are snapshots of their, their time, right? Because these are specimens that were taken out of the mine. They weren't, you know, they were deemed special by the miners and they were impressive enough that they were taken out, but, you know, they're not necessarily in there looking for specific, uh, you know, they're, they're not mining for the minerals. They're, these are things that people thought were special enough to take out and that actually makes them even more interesting. Yes, yeah, absolutely right. Essentially, they were just literally a byproduct of what usually was normally mined and not really, it was not about the specimens. They are all just um, a, a byproduct and, and quite often, um, historically, especially when you, when you look into the silver mining of Saxony or, or the uranium mines in Saxony, uh, when they found a mineralization zone where they found, for example, barites or, or, or silver containing minerals what they would do they would actually blast them so that the miners would not be distracted to collect those things so it was not aimed to collect minerals and and miners being distracted so they would actually on order shoot the cavities of mineral uh, mineral cavities to hell more or less so that the miners would continue on the real important stuff which was the uranium or silver mines for example yeah yeah. And that, that practice so actually continues to this day. Yes, yeah, yeah I'm right. sure you know that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, and I, I say, you know, again, a lot of these sort of old specimens will not be just from, from surface outcrops that have been found. And so they were keeping things in the collections then that we would have deemed adequate nowadays because standards have obviously changed. So, so what did what they call pyromorphite like back then? 
What 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 is the word? Uh, green pyromorph- bio, yeah. so green green le- green lead ore. So they would call a green pyromorphite a green lead ore, a brown pyromorphite brown lead ore, and they would call a cerusite white lead ore. So here you see it, for example, grün blei erz. So they would identify just if by I the color. Correctly, the- it looked like when you guys were scanning over that there was another pyromorphite in there with like really nice sharp crystals as well. Yes, there was, which is actually up here. And that is a fellow from Czech Republic, a pyromorphite from uh, Wenzelsgang in Prebram, central Bohemia. So they, these are really, really um, sharp little crystals and a, a very nice saturated mossy green. Is that the one Very that you had your eye on? Oh yeah, that, that's the one that I went, ooh, that is cute. Yeah, it's quite, uh, it's quite interesting also. I mean, during his time, Archduke Stefan actually uh, went on lots of travels. I mean, he retired and actually then went on to travels. I mean, considering that he only um, made it to this, I mean, he was young and fit when he could start his mineralogical So he often would actually go to the uh, localities himself in order to go to Europe or just in Austria. Um, he would do this on a regular basis over the, those years and years he would yes. amass that collection. Yes. Yeah. Now, one thing that is really interesting with the specimens from Archduke Stefan. So after Rumpf obviously not ever saw, or maybe saw only part of those collection, um, he, in his will, um, put it onto the Natural History Museum in Berlin. So Berlin essentially inherited all those 15, 20,000, who knows the exact number of specimens. And what happened is they couldn't house them all. So So they put, if you go to, for example, to this one here, it's an olivenite from Red Roof and it looks a bit mangled. Now, why is that? Because Berlin actually, because they hadn't had the storage facilities, they needed to cut the labels to size. Oh. So to cut down and trim the labels so that they would fit into the relevant box that also then moved various times i guess we had two world wars and dur- uh, during those times so the collection was wrapped up several times or stayed wrapped and um it really is a shame but some of those labels didn't survive so it's so rare to have actually intact labels that have their full trim and their full um frames and and, and outlines mm. because they usually were trimmed <laughs> wow Almost like stamp collecting at this point. Yeah, it is like, you know, it's like it's like those little, um, what are those cards that you usually use to collect and you, you really have to sort of be a little album I together. Like bubble gum cards. Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays it's Pokemon. I, th- yes. I think it's sort of Americans maybe relate to baseball cards. Yeah. Baseball yeah. Cards. <laughs> yeah. Babe Ruth, you know, I'm just the only or, one or, I really or Pokemon cards, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So let's have another look for a specimen that I find rather interesting. If we, I bring it down to you guys, then it's easier. So we have a really nice electrum yeah. from Russia. So I, you can see that, all right? Oh yeah. Yes. It's it's, it's yeah. interesting to see the the Russian material as well coming all the way out there and. You know, that, that that shows a little bit about how far these specimens were moving to get to his collection. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, weren't the royal families in those days sort of all interconnected in one way or another? So once one found out that there was a mineral collector in the family, things tended to, to go I that way. Were... I mean, C- Catherine the Great picked up a lot of stuff from her a relatives. A little bit related from- yeah, actually, the um, in the case of the Archduke, he, 
he, he had fallen out of favor with the court in Vienna because he didn't have taken place in Hungary. Uh, so really, I think his mineralogical connections were mainly through the scientific world. Uh, mm. And he was very highly regarded amongst universities all across Europe. And uh, they had regular visits to his castle to see his collection. And because of this network of scientists and mineralogists, he, he was able to acquire a lot of this material. Yeah, so here you, for example, and with the Electrum, you have still the label of the of the uh, Humboldt University in Berlin. So obviously there has been an add-on um, and, and a label added to the not only Archduke Stefan and the glued on rump label. But yeah, that must have been always uh, also something that got post tomb then yes. to rump because yes. he certainly wouldn't have had the time to do 15,000. No, not, not, not at all, no. No. I mean, I, I think this post-labeling was done at the Berlin Museum in retrospect, really, from the timeline of it all. So did he get any of Let's his uh, mineral interest from uh, Archduke, like Ferdinand II, who was the, the mineral collector who put together the Ambrasian collection, which is in Vienna? Um, I honestly don't know. I, we've not been able to find that much information on what, what he got his passion from. He was obviously, I say, passionate about collecting and really natural history in general, because I say he was also keen on zoology and biology. And he also amassed a, a library of natural history. Book, thousand books. So he had an all, all round interest in, in natural and history. And he was a bachelor. Yes, yes. There was yes, really nothing else to yeah. do as well. And the thing is, too, obviously, as, as we said, up is saying, he had the natural wealth through, through his aristocracy. And he inherited the estates when his father died. And, uh, 47 to 48, and and then took on like the duties of the Archduke for the last 20, he was able to build the collection. And I think if anything, you can just hope in on this photo. It's a bit of a ropey picture, but you'll see the castle on the hill here. He had this castle specially built to house his uh, natural history collections. And mm. the animal, he had wild animals too, which were kept in cages and the tamer ones roamed, roamed these slopes of the castle. And if you just move to, to your right, please, Verity, this is a picture inside his uh, specially been built mineralogical hall within the castle. And as I say, this had numerous visits from European universities constantly because it, it was really regarded as the best collection in the world. Wow. Wow. That must have been incredible to see. Yeah, I think so as well. So sort of just, I mean, it was, uh, collecting was showing and in, in, in a demonstration of your wealth and your position in, in general during yes. those times. So the more also curiosities you would, would assemble the yes. better you were really and the more interesting of a person you were but i also want to show a couple of specimens because i know if martin stepko is watching it would make him happy um so i'm i'm, I'm sure he, he he would appreciate seeing a couple of slovakian specimens so here we have a nice malachite from libertin slovakia um again one of the more showy specimens so not just a reference really nice crystalline uh, yeah malachite structures here but partly botryoidal in the cavity here so really nice specimen not only a reference specimen but that is um really more seldom when you come to the Archduke stefan collection so here the lovely label with it so and again the handwriting is just also something that alone is is so neatly done yes and it 
he really took its time and you can see uh, alone in that there is no scraggly writing it is always done really sort of almost calm you can see the calm he had, he took or the time he took yeah. to write those labels so wow. that is certainly one some would, of our it, european viewers it would, would appreciate. be it would be fun if somebody could figure out how to make that a font for their computer yes <laughs> It definitely would be. It, it looks always, it, it already looks then so much more classy with with that handwriting, I think, mm -hmm. when you mm -hmm. have just those say, labels. While you've got that, Dan, if you can just home in on the number variety there, the 1443, uh, although we're not dead certain of this, it would seem from the specimens we have that this system, they always put one number over the other, and it would appear in this case that the 144 refers to the species, so it would be malachite, and then the three means that that's the third malachite in his collection. Well, we don't know this for sure, but from the labels we have, it indicates this is certainly the system we tended to use. So was well, there Phil, a you've never seen column? any of those secondary numbers repeated within a series of species, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. And the only time I've found something that differs from that is where what I call the species number, which was the bigger number of written differently for two species. It just seems to be like a type instead of saying 114, they put 141. Uh, and it seems too suspiciously similar to, uh, so it puts that doubt in my mind, but I say from what we've seen of them so far, that's how I think it was done. Okay, so it might have been just uh, accidental transposing of the numbers. It'd be, yes, maybe the Archduke possibly, was possibly. distracted while he was streaming Netflix or something. Yeah. <laughs> must have been, must have been. Yeah. So another specimen I'm, I know that possibly Peter liked as well was this Cerucite. Yes, yeah. I do. So, so that's, again. That's the white lead ore, according to its label, right? You have it, white lead ore, vice Weiss lead. Mm -hmm. So is the collection essentially exclusively European or did he get international? Um, or intercontinental, seems, I should say. Um, it seems that the Majority of specimens is majority, the majority is European. I have not come across no. a, a actually we have here in, in our case we have a couple of specimens. So you have here an Italian specimen, for example. So it gives you a, a little specertine um, with scheelite and muscovite from Italy. So prior to this, you had mentioned so, that we again, were going to cover him. And, and I noticed that he had spent quite a bit of time with his military career in, in Italy. So are these the kind of things that he was obtaining, you know, while he was on, on adventures in Italy? I think he traveled extensively after he finished his professional career, his mil military career. So he might have had an interest already, but as far as I could actually research and read it, um, he did all his travels and started his collection after he retired from the military and not before. Got it. So I think he, he would have then really taken the time to explore and, and go into the Alpine regions or into various um, like Alpine, because I just mentioned it here, you have a nice little quartz from the St. Gotthard mass, Massif, so um, where you have those really sweet little and are those bases original? Um, the bases are just a nice little decoration-y touch that I thought I would, would put in there. So, but they are um, historic bases, but we just, um, I just took the liberty to decorate the showcase. So they are dating also back to the um, early 1900s, those bases. Got it. So what else? I was going to say that's angle sites quite interesting there. That's quite nicely crystallized. Angle site. Oh, yeah. 
And not all, that's, that's also interesting. So here you have an, an, a label, a handwritten label that is coming with the specimen. But here we, for example, have not got an Archduke Stefan label. So you have the Rumpf label. And I think there's still a number on there, if I remember right, maybe not. But um, the specimen itself, so sometimes you have just, so this is, this is obviously a specimen that is a rumpf. So I'm, and I'm sure sometimes rumpf would have um, put in his own collection yes, which as well. Yes, that's true. Yes. Because he already did have a collection that he was adding to with the acquisition of this archduke's. Um, Lauren, you, you like the Adakamite, is that correct? Yeah, I, I just thought it was interesting to see, you know, you got this snapshot in time from back then and you're seeing, you know, Adakamite from the Bad Ems district and most of the time now, if you think about that area, you're, you're thinking about the pyromorphites and yet here you have something that's more typical of being towards the, the, the cap of a deposit, more towards the surface. So it's interesting to, to see that material. Again, I mean, there's nothing crystalline on, on this specimen. It is really just a, a coverage, I would say, or like any micro crystal yes. range. So with, with your eye, there would not be a crystalline structure recognizable. So it's, it looks more like a coating. Yes. Rather than crystal. That's a little bit more of a nerd specimen. Crystals. Yeah, well, you have to have those as well. It's very typical of its day in, in that period in the 1800s. Uh, you know, many other collections we've seen that are comes that have passed through our hands. The quality is just not what we're used to now, but it, it was regarded as, you, you know, the only examples at the time, really. And then we have another specimen I would like to show, which is this calcite here from Herzog August mine in Klausthal Telepate, a very famous mining region indeed. Um, and what is nice, so you not only have your Archduke Stefan labels, so you have also a very old, even I can't read this handwriting, or only with a bit of looking into it. But again, a very descriptive old label, just um, also detailing uh, what the specimen is and, and where it comes from, but I cannot read the signature as to who wrote the label, but it's just nice to see um, together. And I mentioned this before in one of our um, uh, interviews that we are always, and it's very important for us to make sure that the history is kept together for specimens. Again. Oh no, that's a labethanite. Yeah, Zoom that's a labethanite in the, the front there. Oh, this one, yes. Yeah. Nice little Slovakian labethanite. Now that looks well crystallized. That looks like something Martin should love. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and I'm sure I'm sure he, he has his eye on it. But it's, um, he loves, Hi, Martin. Uh, he loves is this from isn't it, isn't it funny that, that you have collectors and, and they really are drawn to collecting mineral specimens from their own country because yeah. most of them have been actually outsourced and you find them in worldwide collections yes. or, and, and not in your own uh, local mineral show or um, with local collectors because there has been a time where your own minerals seem so plentiful and, and that happened, I guess, in everywhere in the yes. world. So that you traded them off to the overseas minerals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Deanna, we're coming down to our last minute of today's program. So if you have any other killers you want to share with us, now would be the time. They are only, only interesting specimens. Killers is something else, I would say, but <laughs> certainly very interesting specimens that, that really needed a little bit of uh, time and, and, and a really a careful look and their beauty is maybe not recognizable at the first glance because they're just not eye popping and jaw dropping crystals that will entice 
increase your interest in looking and researching, there's plenty to discover to all of these specimens. And, and there's a Kongsberg in there somewhere, isn't there? Bottom shelf, middle. <laughs> yeah. There we go. There we are. Sweet little fella. Well, let's hope Gene Myron's still watching. He needs that for his collection that he just walked us through part of. Ran us through. Ran us through. <laughs> <laughs>